everybody pretty much here now, do you think? Okay. So um, my first lecture of the series is inelastic scattering. And so what we're going to talk about is inelastic scattering processes. Now, um, if you remember from the introductions, I'm a physics professor. And so, and what I've decided to do the next 10 years or so is just concentrate on introductory physics classes is what I'm teaching. And so it's always sort of interesting and maybe a little disappointing to know how much people remember after they've done the physics class and gone through it. Um, I know I learned some of what they forget when I read the finals, but it's always sort of interesting a year or two later. So if you remember your freshman physics class, um, you learned we spend an awful lot of time on collisions, uh, it seems like, way more than it's probably worth. Um, and there were two types of collisions when you were doing that. There were inelastic collisions and elastic collisions. Do you remember what the difference between the two things were? How many people did not take freshman physics or a physics class? Okay, good. None? Yeah, okay. All right. So do you remember the difference between inelastic and elastic collisions? No? What's that? One has a spring. Okay, that's interesting. I, this, is, this is as much for me to learn what it is you remember from what I talk about. Yeah. Energy. Energy. What about energy? Okay. Any kind of energy? Does it really lose energy? Transfer energy. So basically what we have is an elastic collision conserves kinetic energy. If you remember, the reason we do, kinet do collisions in physics they, they just introduce, well, most people just introduce it and make you learn all these things and do all this math manipulation. The reason we do collisions is not because we like collisions, it's because it's a conservation law. And that's the most important thing in physics, in, in my mind, is learning about conservation laws. There's such a strong thing in physics when you find something that's conserved. So in inelastic collisions, they conserve momentum, but kinetic energy is not conserved. Um, the energy, some of the kinetic energy can get transformed to heat or deformation or something like that in the, when two cars collide. Uh, elastic collisions conserve both momentum and conserve kinetic energy. So it gives you two conservation laws to work with uh, when you're working out a collision. So elastic collisions conserve kinetic energy, inelastic uh, just momentum, but that energy that is lost from kinetic energy goes somewhere else into thermal or some other process. So what we're going to talk about now is elastic scattering. What we've most of the, what we've talked about so far, uh, the protons, the protons, <laughs> wrong thing, the photons come in and go out with the same amount of energy. And if you remember, um, Kurt said that he talked about it the first day. Energy is related to wavelength. E equals h c over lambda. All right, so uh, if the energy changes or doesn't change, the wavelength of the photon doesn't change. In elastic processes, the photon comes in at one wavelength and leaves with another wavelength. So it's changed its energy during the process, and that energy typically has to go somewhere else. Um, I write here Compton scattering, since you didn't remember a lot about inelastic for elastic, you probably don't remember Compton scattering too well either. Um, Compton scattering, uh, the process, a uh, photon comes in, leaves with a different wavelength, and s the energy goes off into an electron. And it was sort of the idea, the reason you study Compton scattering in physics is because it sh was one of the things that showed that a photon was actually a photon, and a discrete particle, because you could predict things with just collision equations. So anyway, so in, in elastic scattering, a, a photon comes in with one wavelength, leaves with another. The difference between this and fluorescence, which we've been hearing about, is that um, in inelastic scattering processes, for the most part, we talk about uh, the lifetime intermediate is very, very short. The photon comes in and leaves very quickly. Uh, fluorescence, it has more time energy, the photon comes in, is absorbed, it, the energy stays with the uh, molecule for a little while before it leaves. And so that can have, allow other processes, other effects to happen, which um, I don't know if I talk about here, I might talk about in polarization. Yes, ma'am. Do you technically assume that inelastic scattering is 
is not absorbed? In a minute. Okay. So, um, it, two slides from now. Okay. So, um, the strongest and most evident in the natural light field that we see for an inelastic scattering process, and I'm, literally, I'm not talking about fluorescence now, is Raman scattering. Um, but Raman scattering in water is fairly weak compared to Raman scattering if you're a chemist and use Raman techniques. Um, the cross section, this is a picture of Raman scattering showing an excitation at uh, 532 nanometers. It shifts light. The, the light comes in at 532 nanometers. The photon that comes out here is about 660 nanometers in sort of a broad band. Um, this is the light that you're going to get out if you excite with 532 nanometers. This is a bit, little bit larger wave scale. This is from this article by Bray. Um, and we haven't talked about polarization, but this is the depolarization ratio across there. Uh, forget about that part. The main part is if you excite at 532 nanometers, you're going to get a certain amount of light coming out at this higher wavelength at 650 nanometers. And a higher wavelength, remember, means less energy, okay, because energy is inversely proportional. Now, um, here's for Colin's question. Colin, when she was going through absorption in um, phytoplankton, had all these things about energy bands, and you have to match, the, the photon has to match the energy bands to be absorbed. In Raman scattering, it's sort of interesting is that um, you have a photon come in. Um, for Rayleigh scattering, a photon comes in. You can think of a scattering as an absorption for a very, very short time in the, a virtual energy state. Virtual energy states are pretty cool. They're, they're states that the amount of energy there times the time that it, it exists is less than Planck's constant. So we base, it's basically limited by the uncertainty principle. You can't say it did, you can't say it didn't, but anyway. So <laughs> you can think of Rayleigh scattering as being um, the light coming in, being absorbed in this virtual state, coming off very, very quickly, and no change, all right? So Rayleigh scattering, the normal scattering, elastic scattering. Um, the Raman process does the same sort of thing, uh, except when it comes back down, it goes down into a different energy. And this energy difference between where it came in and where it came out is the Raman scattering, okay? And so this energy state is actually a real energy difference. Um, in Raman, what we'll talk about, it's an OH stretch bond. But the light, what happened, because this is a virtual state up here, it can occur for a whole broad range of incoming uh, photon energies, all right? It's, but this shift is, for, is fairly, relatively narrow. So that's why Raman scattering occurs throughout the whole visible spectrum with water. Um, and it goes into these virtual energy states when the photon comes in. Okay, that makes sense? Can you explain more the last one? Wow. Okay, so, so here, here what we have is a photon coming in, going in, exciting um, into this virtual energy state and then coming back and so this energy is less than this energy, so um, the, okay, so this is Stokes scattering where, let's see, so you come in, you excite here, you come off, you have less excitation, it's kept, it's moved the molecule from this energy level to that energy level, okay? The anti-Stokes, it's excited to start with, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, the photon comes in, excites up here, comes down here, it comes off with more energy than the photon came in with, okay? So the, in this case, if you have uh, the molecules all sitting down in this ground, in this state, say ground state or whatever, all right, after the photon's done the interaction, um, the, uh, it's dropped down to this, now the molecule's in an excited state, and the photon coming off has less energy than it had to start with. This is the difference in the energies, okay? This is the predominant one that happens, but you can also have this case if you've managed to have a lot of molecules that are in the higher 
um, a lot of water molecules that are in the higher state. When the photon comes in, it can actually go from this virtual energy state down to a lower state, and the photon that going off would actually have more energy. Mm -hmm. This is a much less probability than this one. What's that? I'm sorry. In the anti-Stokes, yeah. It loses some energy. The photon comes off with more energy. This, this is much, much less probable in general than this one because uh, you have to find molecules in the excited state here versus the other state. But isn't that excited state a vibrational state? So it's an OH stretch state. Kinetic energy to light energy in that yeah, you're, you're moving from OH stretch is the normal. Okay. What's that sort of much less probability difference? Do you have any sense of that? Um, if you have that excited water molecule sufficient to crank the probability of having anti Stokes get them. No, I should have looked it up. Should we be really worried about this? No, you know, no. no. Um, yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> no, but I put it for completeness there. Okay. Um, but that's the ex excited state thing. So for. Uh, Raman scattering, uh, there's two main peaks. If you talk about a peak, I showed you it was an energy difference that was constant. So if you work in these weird units of inverse centimeters, which is a energy, remember the wavelength, the energy is proportional to HC over lambda. So if you use an inverse centimeter unit, that's proportional to an energy type thing. So chemists usually use inverse centimeters. Um, so if you look at the Raman shift in terms of inverse centimeters, this is what it looks like. It's about 30, there's a peak at around 3,200 and a peak of about 3,400 for the Raman shift. And those two peaks vary depending on the temperature of the material. Um, as I say, it's an OH stretch in water. Um, actually, some, as early as the 70s, uh, Hogue and Leonardo Hogue and Caputa um, said that you, you could you'd use this difference in these two peaks in a LIDAR system to measure the temperature or the salinity of the water that you're flying over. In general, they use Raman scattering for a uh, calibration of their fluorescence um, LIDAR system, okay, because it's a fairly constant thing. And here I just give the equation of how you use this Raman shift, you take one over the final wavelength uh, equals one over the original wavelength minus this shift. Okay? So that's what the spectrum basically looks like for Raman scattering. Um, importance in the natural light field. So here's a little history. Um, in the early 80s, before the, in the 60s and 70s and 50s, we had instruments that had basically one wavelength. In general, people used instruments that were centered and photopic. In, in, o in optical oceanography, you used instruments that were centered around the eye's response, which is called photopic response. Um, around the early, in the late 70s, people started getting more fancier spectrometers to be able to do wavelength dependence properties. Um, early 80s, uh, there were these multi-channel radiometers that could do quick profiles. Um, example is this one made by Biospherical called MER 1032. It had, um, what, about 12 channels of upwelling radiance, which you haven't learned anything about yet. We're going to talk about next week. Upwelling radiance, 12 channels of upwelling irradiance, and 12 channels of downwelling irradiance. Um, and so why it was 32, I don't know. But anyway, it had about that many channels. Um, and people were noticing some really weird results with them. Uh, diffuse attenuation coefficients, we haven't learned about either. So this is probably out of place when I think about the terms I'm trying to use. Diffuse attenuation coefficient is like the beam attenuation we've been talking about, except um, it's for the irradiance. So you're not worried about a, how well a beam transmits. You just want to know how well the light field is decreasing, okay? What people were seeing was uh, the diffuse attenuation coefficients at different parts of the spectrum was less than uh, water absorption. 
And so they were trying to figure out what is going on here. Well, how can it possibly be less than water absorption? Um, you'll find out next week that sort of the approximation for a diffuse attenuation coefficient is the absorption plus backscattering. So there's no way it should be less than absorption. Um, here's an example. Here's a diffuse attenuation for the light, the radiance uh, coming up. Um, here's the absorption for water. Here's the, this diffuse attenuation coefficient. If you calculate it for between 1 and 5 meters, 5 and 9 meters, and 1 and 9 meters. And so in this region, its absorption is less than this diffuse attenuation. But as we move toward the red, you're seeing this effect, this weird deal where the diffuse attenuation is, is less than absorption. And that, that can't happen. Um, so we were, at the time, we were looking for what was wrong. I had gotten to the Viz Lab for my postdoc about the same time as we got the 1032 at the Viz Lab. And one of my assignments was to figure out if there was a light leak in the instrument. Because you can imagine, um, if you look at the spectrum, there's a lot of light in the blue and less light in the red. So if there's a light leak in your red channel that's allowing some blue light in, it might have this effect of decreasing the, uh, decreasing the attenuation coefficient. So we were all working on tr trying to figure out what was wrong with our instruments. Where was the problem? Um, let me see something quickly. OK. Interesting. Listen to your advisors. Um, my advisor is Ed Fry. It was Ed Fry, my PhD advisor. He is really, really smart really has a zillion ideas um, all the time. And one of the ways I learned to graduate was I stopped listening to what he told me exactly. When he would come into my, uh, my lab and I'd be working on something, he'd go, Ken, we ought to try this. And I'd listen to him very politely and go, that's great, Ed. And he'd leave and I'd go back to try to finishing the project I knew I had to do to finish my dissertation. Okay. <laughs> Now, that's really good for finishing. I was like a record finisher in, at A&M at the time. I, it took four and a half years or something versus eight, ten, what most of the people were doing. But I didn't listen to him all the time. And so he came to my lab, like 82, and said, Ken, we ought to take our scattering instrument and measure Raman scattering. And I looked up with the cross sections for, for Raman scattering and said, that's nice, Ed. And he left, and I never paid attention to him. <laughs> and so then, then I went to um, graduate, or did my postdoc, and I'm working on this thing, and trying to figure out what's going on. We knew Ramon scattering was important for lasers and stuff. The cross section was really small. Nobody, f we didn't think that that was possible to see in the real life, in real world, in water. But there was a series of people that put, pointed out that Raman scattering actually was important. The first one was um, Shigahara in 84, who published in the Japanese, or well, the Journal of Oceanography Society of Japan, not widely read in the US. Um, so I don't think anybody really paid attention. In the US, we were, it was like 84 when I was doing these experiments trying to figure things out. So um, we didn't really know that one. Then really, Bob Stauben is the one who brought it out in 1988 with Alan Weidemann. And then um, Marshall and Smith did the, uh, also sort of followed up um, in 99, 1990 with doing models with Raman scattering and comparing it with measurements and showing that Raman scattering was important. If my, I had followed my advisor's advice, I might have been back over here figuring out in 82 what was going on. But anyway, I did graduate, so that was good. <laughs> um, OK, so it was in the, in the 80s, 90s. The characteristics for Raman scattering, very weak. Um, as I said, it's uh, 1 times 10 to minus 4 per meter uh, versus Rayleigh scattering is 1.8 times 10 to minus 3, the, the elastic part that we talk about for molecular scattering is about an order of magnitude bigger. Um, the scattering phase function, have we talked about? We did talk about scattering phase functions. 
It's a lot like the water Rayleigh scattering, except the depolarization is higher than the water's molecular scattering, you know, elastic uh, depolarization. The wavelength shift, as I showed you, is about 3,400 inverse centimeters. Um, the strength, uh, water elastic Rayleigh scattering has a lambda to the minus four or so dependence we talked about. Raman scattering um, depends on what you're whether you're talking about excitation or emission and whether you're using photons or energy, but it's somewhere around lambda to the minus five. There's some variations depending on what you're, how you're trying to use it. Um, that energy shift of 3,400 inverse centimeters, because it's an energy shift like that, causes a varying shift in wavelength. Um, at, uh, if you excite at 400 nanometers, say, the shift is on the order of 60 nanometers. If you excite at 600 nanometers, the shift is on the order of 120 nanometers. So it's a constant energy shift, but it varies with wavelength as you go through the spectrum. Uh, but it's the one that we're worrying about is always taking light from the blue and shifting it up into the red wavelengths. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just, okay, the difference between the 3200 and the 3400 is the effect on the OH uh, stretch of that interaction between water molecules, okay? And so it, it shifts between, uh, I forget which one goes up with hot or higher or colder, how often you have these certain bonds between the different water molecules. Um, so if... You always have the two peaks. It looks like one for the most part, unless you deconvolve it. Four. The, the, the 3,400 is a rough number for the, the main, the biggest the peak, peak there. It, they're all, it, yeah. Okay. It's a broad, it's not like excitation 400 gives you exactly this wavelength. It's a broad, it's yeah. that spectrum around that that I showed before. Anything else? Maybe you start the red. Okay, so why is it important in the light field? We've, if you look at what's going on in the light field, we have, this is the downwelling irradiance at the surface. There's all these spectral lines due to um, f solar Fraunhofer lines and over here due to water absorption and, and atmospheric effects. Um, so it's not a nice smooth curve. But uh, if you look at the upwelling light, the upwelling light field is, is shown in this red curve here. And what you see is here's 400 nanometers, 500 nanometers. So the upwelling light field in clear water is, has a lot of light in the blue and not so much light in the red. And well, in the green and going toward the red. So if you have a process that's moving light from the blue light into the red light, it will become more and more important and dominate over here. And so that's why we were seeing the Ramon scattering causing this weird effect. Um, here's another picture, sort of the same thing. If you look at the surface irradiance over this sort of part of the scale, 400 to 700 nanometers, as you go down in the water column, the downwelling irradiance decreases from the surface. This is one meter, uh, 10 meters, and 20 meters. You can see quickly you lose the light at the red wavelengths. And so if you have some process moving light energy from here over to there, it's going to become important as you 
go down in the water column. Um, here's a graph, and I tried to, after all of our, wow, what did happen there? Oh, I see, yeah. After all of our uh, discussions about how small your, your things were, your numbers were, I had to put a, come back and try to put n bigger numbers on there so you could read them and give a good example. So um, this is 0.3, this is zero. Uh, this is, means that it's 400 nanometers and zero. So the X is 400, the zero, the Y is zero. This is 750 nanometers. What we're showing here is the Raman fraction of the upwelling irradiance. So Raman's important because it shifts light from where there's a lot of it to where there's not very much elastic light. And what it really means is you have to be careful when you're in the field and, and evaluating measurements at these higher wavelengths. Um, if you look, well, you can't probably tell too well. This is 10%, so between 400 and 450 nanometers, um, it's about 10%, but it raises up to 25% or so at wavelengths above 500 nanometers in this case. Uh, for This is for clear sea, pure seawater, and the differences here are the different at sun angles at 20 degrees, 37 degrees, or 60 degrees. So sun angle didn't matter too much. For pure water, though, it's a large component here, but even in the blue, it's, it's still 10 to 15%. Um, over here I have the uh, same sort of thing, but now we're looking at the Raman fraction and the upwelling radiance. And it's above, once again, it's around 10% in the 400 to 450 nanometer range and about the same 25% in, uh, in the red wavelengths. Okay? So it's a large component of the upwelling light field in, um, in, in, sea water, in clean seawater. To look how it varies with chlorophyll, this is all from a paper by Howard Gordon. Um, if we look at how it varies with uh, chlorophyll, or yeah, with chlorophyll and wavelength, if you look at low chlorophyll, um, at 443 nanometers in the blue, it's a small fraction of the upwelling radiance, but it's a large fraction of the, of the uh, red wavelengths. If you look um, at higher chlorophyll, you'll notice it sort of inverts, that it has, it's a um, larger fraction, it's a larger fraction at 443 than it is up here at, in the red wavelengths. Why is that, do you think? Why would it shift from, from one to the other? A big absorption peak where? Okay, not, probably that absorption peak, th we're not up at the 600, the, the highest wavelengths, 595. Okay, okay. So in, in, the, um, in the blue wavelengths, remember the light field shifts in, in, as the chlorophyll increases from being blue and upwelling to more green. So what you're doing is you're shifting light, the light field such that there's not as much excitation in the blue wavelengths when you get into high chlorophyll levels, okay? So there's not as much excitation light available, so there's not as much Raman shift into the other wavelengths. So this is, so you have to, with Raman, you have to worry about, in terms of the percent of the light field, both what's there for elastic scattering and also what's there for the um, excitation to be shifted over into the wavelengths. So as, you, as you're increasing there, um, what you're seeing, in, okay, so there's, there's two things I should mention here. Um, what you're seeing here is that the light field is decreasing probably in the, uh, in the blue. As the chlorophyll increases, the light field does decrease in the blue. Um, now, uh, we've warned you, look at your, who's, what the models are and all this stuff. Um, these are Howard's models, Howard Gordon's models. Uh, and remember the shift at 443 nanometers is coming from 380, 390 nanometers, below 400 nanometers. Um, we don't, 
for the most part, we don't have a really good handle, and Howard definitely doesn't have a good thing in his models below 400 nanometers in the UV. There isn't as much information out there. We're starting to work harder. The field is starting to work harder at those lower wavelengths. But I don't, I wouldn't really trust a lot the 443 because of where the excitation's coming from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It, it does. It's got the background. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It uses. I'm. Sh he uses most most of this time. He's using Morel's model that has a CDUM that's proportional to chlorophyll, and he's doing some in there. But um, okay. What else about that I should mention there? Uh, and to do. To do any of these number calculations, these are all Monte Carlo m models, um, to do a calculation like to find out what the Raman is component is this component at this wavelength, you have to do a whole series of elastic calculations at the wavelength below. So if, if remember, what we had was that one wavelength here goes over into that way that shifted excitation. So if you excite here, you're going to get a, a wave uh, light out looking like that from the Raman process. If you're going to do one of these calculations, you want to know how much light's here, you sort of have to take the inverse from that side and do a calculations at all these different wavelengths of the elastic light field to figure out how much light's at this wavelength that can get shifted over. So it's a, fr it's a very time-consuming process to do uh, Raman scattering calculations in general with, I guess, with hydrolyte because it does all these things so fast anyway, it doesn't really matter too much. Here's what was happening. Ken's drawing this emission spectrum here. The guy runs hydrolyte, and he's he's uh, he's got a, a black sky, and he's putting in a laser back here at 488 or whatever it was, and he's getting the Raman emission spectrum that looked like this. The shoulders were reversed. And so he said, well, Kurt, this is wrong, because the Raman emission has the peak and the shoulders here on the left at the lower wavelength. And when I look at the, the Raman emitted light in hydrolyte, and he was down at 50 meters or whatever it was, I'm getting the reverse. So hydrolyte's wrong. And I spent like a week trying to figure this out, and I dragged a George Catawar into it, and he couldn't figure it out. And finally, we realized with some simulations what's going on that, remember, water absorption. So this, this was out at, uh, I can't remember, 600 nanometers or whatever. But remember, water absorption is increasing out there. So up near the surface, we were getting this. But when you go down to depth, the, the lower, the higher absorption at this wavelength was knocking down your ability to see this. I guess he was looking at remote sensing reflective spec or something like that. But what was happening is that the high water absorption was knocking down this peak faster than it was this one. And so the things reversed. So in, when you get hydrolyte and install it, if you look on the documents directory, there's a whole set of notes there on how to interpret Raman 
effects in hyperlight that explain this. But it was one of these things where it was a really good question, and it took me and Katawar and one of his grad students together about three weeks to figure out what was going on, and then it all made sense. But yeah, it's not trivial or not not trivial to understand these things like Raman scattering in, in going from the physics that Ken's talking about to going to what would this look like in a remote sense of reflected spectrum to what it would look like if you were 100 meters deep in the ocean. Weird things can happen because these other things come into effect like water absorption is not constant with wavelength and so that does strange things. And you, can, you know, if you're interested in this, you can look at those notes. It's got it all worked out, all the examples. But it's a complicated business. Okay. Um, so how do you measure Raman scattering if you want to to do that? Um, in, the, in the lab, you can do 90 degree scattering experiments. Um, you have to be really careful to exclude the excitation because we're talking about 10 to the minus 4 difference or so. Um, and you have to be careful your polarization effects on the instrumentation because the Roman scattering is polarized. Um, in the field, uh, you can make measurement indirectly, you can see the Roman, you make measurements and model how much, uh, what the light field would look like if you just had elastic scattering um, built up from your IOPs. And then uh, sort of figure Raman is the difference between what you measured and what you would have modeled. That's basically what Stavin's paper and uh, Marshall and Smith's paper were based on. There's another way you can directly see the Raman scattering, and that's through something called the ring effect. And this is probably the, um, there were three groups simultaneously and independently working on these lines in the 90s. So I'm sorry that if I do the history of this, because it's sort of fun in a way. Um, there was a group at NOSC, which is a Navy group at, uh, in San Diego. I think they're now called SPAWAR. Um, they were worried about satellite laser communication and were worried if Ramon would shift the light into some place where they didn't want the light to be. Um, George Cadawar at A&M started thinking about this as, an, as a theorist. And then at UM, we started doing it thinking about it and trying to do it. It's just probably the, I'm sorry if I, this is probably the thing I'm proudest of, is sitting in a, a daydreaming in an AGU meeting. I was sitting there going, because we were thinking about Raman scattering, and I was thinking going, how could I measure Raman scattering in the field? Oh, there's solar front offer lines. That would be the way I could see the change in these solar front offer lines because the Raman scattering is relatively broad versus those sharp things I showed you. And so I thought, oh, this would be really cool. I'll try this. And so I went on my interview trips for my faculty position. And I went to one of the guys, the optical person, the really good optical person in the department, Joe Hirschberg, and I said, I've got this idea when I come here, this is what I'm gonna do. And he goes, oh, that's the ring effect. I said, what? <laughs> that, that's the ring effect. It's really, it's, the astronomers have used it for years to look at um, f uh, fluorescence in the moon or something like that. Um, turns out they also used it with LIDAR systems to look at the health of uh, trees and, and uh, fields of uh, plants. You can see water stress in, by looking at this. So anyway, it wasn't that great. I, well, it was a pretty good idea, but it, it wasn't original. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so we started looking at this experimentally to see if we could measure them on and separate the two in the light field. And so um, if you look in the blue, as I said, in the blue, it's not a big deal. This is a picture of a high, this 43 to 48 nanometers, uh, the spectrum at the surface. You see the front offer line. And as we go down in the water column, there's very little change in the front offer line. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, the front line. Oh, the, uh, OK, the front offer line is this, it's a, it's a solar absorption line. It's, it's due to absorption of, um, of the light in the sun by, uh, by uh, atoms, atoms in the sun, okay? So basically, if you, if you remember, I showed you, uh, I showed you there, 
these really sharp features in the solar spectrum at the surface are basically due to Fraunhofer lines absorbing. Up here, as Colin showed, there's, there's some atmospheric absorption lines. But these are mostly solar Fraunhofer lines. They're very sharp features. So is that like removal at the source then, basically? Basically, extraterrestrially, when the light comes down on the, on to our app before, on top of the atmosphere, it's got these lines already in there. So they're a constant. So um, unless something shifts light into that wavelength, they, sh they should never fill up. They should always look the same. So this is irradiance in, at different depths. There's virtually no change. Versus if you look at the uh, red wavelengths, if we start at the surface, you have a nice front offer line here at 656 nanometers. As you go down to 20 meters, the solar front offer line has basically disappeared. These are all logarithmic. Um, scales and so if the um, so the fact that the shape changed on this logarithmic scale shows that there must be extra light in there okay so you can separate using this ring effect you can separate between um, the uh, solar you can separate the elastic from the inelastic part um, you could also use this thing for uh, fluorescence um, in this 680 nanome 89 nanometers, we're really not seeing much. This is in the Shark River. Um, I'm not sure why I'm showing this because there doesn't seem to be much of a change that you can see there. Here's above uh, a head of brain coral. Um, so this is the downwelling irradiance. This is the upwelling ra radiance right above this piece of brain coral, coral, and you're seeing the fluorescence from the things in the brain coral. I, I'm, I'll use the real biological term, the things in the brain coral here. Um, you also see, actually, you actually see fluorescence quenching if you look in there too, in that um, the fluorescence decreases or it, it decreases as the sun gets higher in the sky. Okay, so other inelastic processes. <coughs> Brillouin scattering. You can get scattering uh, where incident beam comes in, scatters actually off sound, um, off uh, sound pressure gradients in the in the water. You get the scattered beam. There's a shift in wavelength. This this shift is very small. Uh, at 530 nanometers, with typical uh, velocity of sound, it depends on the velocity of sound. It depends on the index refraction. Uh, beam uh, speed of light. The wavelength shift on this is only like seven times ten to the minus three nanometers. So it's so small that none of most of us are ever going to see it uh, in our measurements. Uh, it depends on the speed of sound and the index refraction. Index refraction depends on salinity and temperature. Um, so does the speed of sound depends on the temperature. Um, but the sound speed depend changes more rapidly with temperature. So you can use this Brillo one. Uh, scattering to help you determine what the temperature is in the water. And so that's been uh, proposed a few times to do LIDAR measurements and measure the temperature profile in the water using this Brillouin shift, which is pretty small, so it's pretty, needs really good. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The um, I was gonna I, I'll say it in a minute or two, but um, Ed Fry got funded from the Navy to uh, do, to start developing that to do profiles with lidar systems, and there was a postdoc in his lab, uh, Thomas Walter, who uh, when he went back to Germany after his postdoc, has continued doing this. So he has a system on a helicopter that's trying to that's working at getting these temperature profiles using the Brillo on shift. So, um, so fluorescence, uh, 
the distinction, remember, was lifetime between the two, so it's a longer intermediate state, so more chance that the, uh, the light can forget about what the incoming photon was doing. And so uh, the phytoplankton fluorescence is basically isotropic emitted, isotropically emitted versus the uh, Raman scattering, remember, has a, a phase function that looks like water, uh, looks like elastic Rayleigh scattering. Um, it's phytoplankton fluorescence is also probably completely depolarizing because it's been there, the photon's been in there long enough. Um, people have, uh, these guys talk about using it to try to uh, separate, use uh, the depolarization ratio to separate uh, the fluorescence from the natural light field. Um, there's actually, there are people using it to look at extracted compounds. Uh, the polarization properties to look at extracted compounds from different organisms. Um, but in general, the polarization, because it's that, it's sort of like the time that uh, the photon has to forget its history before it comes back out, it's used in general as an indication of the lifetime. The longer the lifetime, the less polarization when it comes out there and uh, diffusion of the energy in the 404. Anyway, that's not a worry, too much problem in, you know, what we're working with. Um, other uh, fluorescence things, uh, CDOM fluorescence, and by the way, um, right after me, uh, Mary Jane's going to talk about fluorescence, so I'm not going to talk about that too much for chlorophyll. Um, there's this cool EAMS technique, excitation emission spectroscopy. Uh, where you vary the excitation wavelength and you vary and look at the different emission wavelengths. And for CDOM, say, you can characterize them in terms of the different blobs of where they fall on these, on these excitation emission profiles. They're pretty cool. Um, and you, anyway, they're pretty cool to look at. Um, I'm not sure how far they've really gotten in in analyzing them. I, they've been doing these for years and years, and I went to an AGU recently and thought, oh, I'll sit in this session and see what they learned. Um, it's still sort of this blob falls here and this blob falls there, so. But it's pretty cool. Um, if you think about what these excitation emission things look like uh, or what it means, um, if you excite at one wavelength and just look at the ver various emission ones, that's sort of the more common thing. So you're looking basically on a slice that up like that through the material. Okay, uh, CUM, as you have figured out already, uh, typically we measure with absorption instead of with fluorescence. Here's things like you've already seen of uh, CUM absorption profile or spectra. But you could also measure CDOM with fluorescence. Here's excitation at 350 nanometers versus emission, looking at uh, some sample. Uh, ECO, there's a wet labs instrument that measures CDOM by exciting at 370 nanometers and looking at the emission at 460 nanometers. Um, in most of the time when we're talking about upwelling radiance, we don't really worry about CDOM fluorescence. Why do you think that would be? Okay. Look at that graph and tell me. So, well, when the CDOM ab absorbs, it, it f will fluoresce. Okay. Yeah, so you're basically absorbing here and emitting over into there. There's a whole bunch of light already in the light field at those wavelengths. And so um, the CDOM uh, fluorescence gets swamped by the elastic scattering component. So in the natural light field, we don't really seem to have to worry about that. Um, it'd be really neat to have uh, what you need to do to do the uh, radiative transfer modeling well, or one way, is using this quantum fluorescence efficiencies for the CDOM that tell you if you excite here how much goes off into this wavelength quantitatively. And um, 
you really don't see people measuring that very much or, or reporting that. There was one exception, there was a Haas paper in 1992 that did concentration on concentration samples, did this to try to do it for an optical oceanography type purpose. But if you talk to the um, photochemists and the chemical oceanographers, uh, when you concentrate the CDOM uh, materials, you change them so drastically that they don't think that it's really relevant anymore for the ocean. Most of these uh, CDOM fluorescents are related to quinine sulfate or some other material, so it's a normalized fluorescence that they're talking about, or a QSU unit, quinine sulfate equivalent. Um, other things, oils fluoresce. So this is, uh, it's not much better on my screen than this screen, so I can't tell you too much. But it's UV, um, UV excitation, and the emission comes off uh, out here still, I think, in the UV. And basically what this is trying to show is that different kinds of oils uh, fluoresce differently, and you can use them to, as a finger trip, fingerprint to try to determine where the oils come from in terms of like oil spills and such. But it's not a big problem in the natural light field. Um, kept this in there because it was just pretty. Um, so if you're for the geologists in the room, uh, minerals also fluoresce. Uh, this is uh, so when they're illuminated by UV light and so they can use that to help them tell about the minerals, but it's in the UV light and it's not where it's not a problem for us. So, so basically, conclude. Um, inelastic scattering important when you're modeling the light field and comparing your models with data. You remember I showed you it's at least 10% of the data of the um, light field up to 25 or 30% or more. Um, so that's important to do. Brillouin scattering could be cool for LIDAR remote sensing temperature. As I told, we just said, Thomas Walter is trying to work on it. Um, CDOM fluorescence, uh, important in terms of these EMs and trying to uh, discriminate CDOM, but not a real big deal in the light field in general. Uh, oil and mineral, or you don't have to worry about it in this class, but it was, the minerals are pretty, so I showed those. So the other thing, as I said, um, it's important to take point into consideration when modeling a light field. Uh, Emmanuel points out that um, something we haven't talked about yet, but sh when you put an instrument in the water, the instrument shadows, and people try to come up with shadowing correction, and basically almost no one has a shadowing correction, including Ramon at this point. Nobody that I know of is using, for sure, a, a shadowing correction, including Ramon. We're working on one, but, okay. What's that? Need to cloak the instrument. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a, <laughs> okay, yes, ma'am. I, I'm not understanding something. Well, when you think about trying to make measurements of things, you were, you were able to measure how much you know, more energy was being converted into what green photon. It's a one to one equivalency. So if you measured in photons, you wouldn't notice a change with Ramon, but if you measured it in energy, which is what we, you, you would, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
in, in general, though, um, we're we're reporting in energy, but we're measuring in photons <laughs> in almost all the instruments because um, they're all quantum. True. Anything else? Nope. Okay. All right. So um, I guess we're going to take a 15-minute break, and there's things up there.